Hi, welcome to Chapter 13 Solutions. Today's tip is to make sure you are timing yourself um, when you go through your practice problems. So, it's not so important that you time yourself as you're learning the concepts, but once you feel like you've got that concept mastered, you want to make sure you are timing yourself and giving yourself about a minute and a half per problem on average. Some problems you'll be able to knock out in less than a minute, some problems might take you two to three minutes, but make sure on average you're hitting about a minute and a half per problem. So we're going to go ahead and get started with number one. Number one tells us that Karen has three shirts, five pairs of pants, and two types of jewelry, and we want to know how many different outfits she can make based on what she has available. Notice that the problem says that she may wear jewelry, but she may not wear jewelry. So it's a little twist on the fundamental counting principle, which just tells us we can multiply the numbers in each category together. So if she decides to wear jewelry, we have 3 times 5 times 2, which is 30 different combinations she can have. However, she might also decide not to wear jewelry, which is a different outfit. So we'll get rid of this category and simply multiply the 3 and the 5 to get 15. So she has a total of 45 options for her outfit, which is B. Number 2. Number 2 asks us how many ways the following list of numbers can be arranged. So let's say that we were just looking at the numbers 3 and 5, the first two numbers. 3 and 5 can be the number 35 or the number 53. So this is a permutations question because order does give us a different option. It gives us a different number. So since this is a permutations question and we're taking seven numbers, seven at a time, we can simply do seven factorial to get our answer. However, you'll notice that the five is repeated, which means we have to divide by two factorial. And then also the three is repeated. So we have to divide by 2 factorial again. If, for example, we had had 3 fives, we would have to divide by 3 factorial. Keep that in mind. Okay? So for this, you're just going to use your calculator. Remember, 7 factorial is just 7 times 6 times 5 all the way down to 1, divided by 2 times 1 times 2 times 1. So this product is 4, so we can cancel it with the 4 here in the numerator and simply multiply 7 times 6 times 5 times 3 times 2 and we get 1,260. Chance of rolling a 3 and then our second roll is also going to be a 1 6 chance of rolling a 6. So now all you have to do is figure out whether you're multiplying or adding your two probabilities together. So these are two separate rolls and you have a 1 6 chance and a 1 6 chance. Remember that the word and means multiply. So it's simply 1 over 36 for your answer, which is answer choice A. Number 4. Number 4 is similar to number 3. They are, we're being asked to find the probability of rolling a 3 or a 6. So in this case, we're only rolling the die one time, and we're interested in either getting a 3 or a 6. So that would be the probability of getting a 3, the or means add, or getting a 6, so that would be 2 6 when we add, which simplifies to 1 third. Number 5. Number 5, we're told that Jack has 12 pairs of socks, 4 black, 5 striped, and 3 argyle, and we're asked to find out how many socks he needs to pull out in order to be guaranteed that he gets at least 2 of each pair. We're told that the socks are pinned together, so whenever he reaches in, he's grabbing a matched pair. So you don't have to worry about um, the, the socks coming out together because they are paired up. Okay? Um, now, under the best situation, if we're looking for the fewest pull, pulls possible, Jack would have to pull out six pairs of socks. He would get two argyle, two striped, and two black. So that could happen. Um, he could just pull out six pairs to get two of everything. However, if he's not looking into the drawer, we don't know which order the socks will come out in. So we have to think of something else in order to be guaranteed that he'll get two of each type. So, for example, um, if he pulls out six, he might get four black pairs and two argyle pairs and not have any striped pairs. So to avoid that situation, you have to imagine that 
First, he pulls out all of the pairs that are represented to the highest number, which would be the five striped pairs. So imagine that his first five pulls, he gets all striped, okay? Then you go to the next lower category. His next four pulls, he gets all of the black socks. So that's a total of nine pairs. And then he has two, at least two striped, at least two black. So now he can pull out two argyle. So that gives us a total of 11 because he doesn't have to pull out all three here. So if he pulls out 11 pairs, we can be guaranteed that he will have at least two of each. Number five. Number five, we're told that Jack has 12 pairs of socks four black, five striped, and three argyle, and we're asked to find out how many socks he needs to pull out in order to be guaranteed that he gets at least two of each pair. And we're told that the socks are pinned together, so whenever he reaches in, he's grabbing a matched pair. So you don't have to worry about um, the, the socks coming out together because they are paired up, okay? Um, now, under the best situation, if we're looking for the fewest pull, pulls possible, Jack would have to pull out six pairs of socks. He would get two argyle, two striped, and two black. So that could happen. Um, he could just pull out six pairs to get two of everything. However, if he's not looking into the drawer, we don't know which order the socks will come out in. So we have to think of something else in order to be guaranteed that he'll get two of each type. So for example, um, if he pulls out six, he might get four black pairs and two argyle pairs and not have any striped pairs. So to avoid that situation, you have to imagine that first he pulls out all of the pairs that are represented to the highest number, which would be the five striped pairs. So imagine that his first five pulls, he gets all striped, okay? Then you go to the next lower category. His next four pulls, he gets all of the black socks. So that's a total of nine pairs. And then he has two, at least two striped, at least two black. So now he can pull out two argyle. So that gives us a total of 11 because he doesn't have to pull out all three here. So if he pulls out 11 pairs, we can be guaranteed that he will have at least two of each. Number six. For number six, we're told that Jeter is playing darts and he gets his dart somewhere within this region. We're asked for the probability that he gets it within this part of the region. So we're told that he gets it in this figure, but outside of the square. So we need to know the probability of that, and this is geometric probability. It's similar to um, regular probability. So instead of favorable outcomes, we're looking for the favorable area, which is the area that we're interested in, divided by the total area. Okay. So our favorable area it's hard to figure out what these three triangles are. It is possible to figure out um, the dimensions of these three individual triangles. However, it's easier to figure out the area of the entire triangle and then subtract the area of the square. And then what's left is our favorable area, okay? So we want the area of the entire triangle. This is an equilateral triangle. So the formula for the area of an equilateral triangle as I'm sure you recall, is the side length squared times the square root of 3 over 4, okay? So that's the area of an equilateral triangle. From that, we are going to subtract the area of the square, which is simply s squared, because it's the, the base times the height, okay? So that's going to give us our numerator. So our favorable area is t squared, square root of 3 over 4, minus s squared divided by our total area, which again is just the area of the big equilateral triangle. So we get t squared root 3 over 4. Now we are challenged with simplifying this because a lot of the answer choices look similar to this but not exactly like this. Okay? So one thing that we can do to simplify it is to get rid of this in the denominator because we're dividing by a fraction. Okay? You might also notice that this is the same as this. So we can actually simplify this first part of it. However, make sure that you don't just cross it out because this s squared also has to be divided by t squared square root of 3 over 4. So what you need to keep in mind here is that if you have a minus b over c, that's the same as a over c minus b over c. 
So then we would be able to simplify this part of it, but leave this part um, as is, okay? So if you simplify this part, this divided by this is simply one minus s squared divided by t squared root three over four. When you divide by a fraction, that is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So we get one minus s squared times four divided by t squared root three. Okay, now we're almost done. You cannot leave a square root in the denominator, so you have to rationalize the denominator. So remember in order to rationalize the denominator, we simply multiply by whatever the square root is. So we have the square root of three, we're going to multiply the bottom by the square root of 3. In order to keep um, our fraction equivalent, we have to multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of 3. So the square root of 3 times the square root of 3 is the square root of 9, which is simply 3. So this denominator is 3t squared, and our numerator is 4 root 3s squared. And this is all still being subtracted from 1. So this is our answer. However, you'll notice that our answer choice is just as one large fraction. So we need to get this to be one fraction. So this one can be placed over one, and we can multiply the top and bottom by 3t squared to get a common denominator. So we get 3t squared over 3t squared mi minus 4 square root of 3s squared over 3t squared. And now that we have a common denominator, we can simply subtract. And since they are not like terms, they're going to stay separate. So 3t squared minus 4 root 3s squared over 3t squared. Okay, and it ended up being quite messy. So the answer to number 6 is C. Number 7. Number seven, we're told that the students are graduating from a, at a preschool ceremony and all of the girls want to enter the ceremony together and all of the boys want to enter the ceremony together. And we're asked how many different ways the students can file into the ceremony given that they're coming in single file. Okay? So even though all the girls want to come in together, we don't know if the girls are going to enter first and then all the boys or the boys are going to enter first and then all of the girls. So we have two different scenarios here. Okay? Now, we have five girls. Let's say that the girls come in first. They're going to take these first five slots. Now, let's say that um, for our first girl, we realize that we have five choices because we can choose any of the five girls to come in first. Once that first girl has been chosen, then uh, for the next slot, we only have four girls to choose from. The slot after that, three girls, then two girls, then one girl. So that's simply five factorial. You might have realized that right off the bat. Okay, if not, write out your slots. Then for the next section, um, the boys are gonna start coming in. For the first boy, we have four boys to choose from. That is four times the second slot, we have three boys, then two boys. For the very last, last slot, there's only one boy left, so there is no choice. That boy is coming through. Okay, so that's simply four factorial. If you did that first part, that's great. However, we have to keep in mind that the boys could have come in first. So that's 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Or, I mean, sorry, followed by the girls, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So you'll notice that that's just 4 factorial times 5 factorial. So to get our final answer is 5 factorial times 4 factorial plus 4 factorial times 5 factorial, okay? 5 factorial is 120, 4 factorial is 24, so that is 2,880. You'll see that we just have the same thing repeated here, so that's another 2,880. So there are actually a whopping 5,760 ways that these nine students can enter into the ceremony. That wraps up chapter 13. I hope that went well for you. Make sure you go ahead and do the associated problems in the official guide. And at this point, if you haven't already, make sure you begin timing yourself. You have about a minute and a half on average per problem. So good luck and we'll see you back for chapter 14.